Well, welcome back uh, to State of the Map uh, 2021. Our next speaker is Frederick Ram. Um, he's going to be talking about with great power comes responsibility. Uh, Frederick's a member of the Data Working Group and a former board member and also an author on a book on the book of OpenStreetMap. So we look forward to his talk and please do remember to put your questions in the chat and we'll hear from Patrick shortly. He's on his way. Thank you. Hello, my name is Frederick and I am going to talk about access tagging in OpenStreetMap. The problems I'm discussing aren't new. They have been with OSM for a while, but with the rising popularity of OpenStreetMap, we have more apps and more websites using OpenStreetMap to lead cyclists or hikers somewhere. And also th the pandemic has played its part because many more people have flocked to these apps to find a nice walk in the vicinity of whatever the lockdown rules allowed them to go. The number of complaints that the data working group has received in the last couple of year has risen sharply. Last year we had about 80 complaints where someone said, please delete this thing from the map. This year is probably going to be more than 100 extrapolating from what we already have. And of course, these complaints take a wide range. There will be some where someone says, uh, the owners are not interested in making the location of this building known. And then our response is, well, but we are, please go away. Um, there are others where we clearly act and delete something from OSM, like this path has vanished in the 1964 earthquake. Wait a minute, is OSM really that old? But yes, there, there was a path in OSM that did not exist since 1964. Uh, so, that these are the easy bits, but many requests actually take the form of people are hiking through our garden, please delete this path, or um, people are cycling through the nature reserve, please delete this path. And then apparently when these landowners confront someone or, or state uh, park rangers confront someone uh, using a path they shouldn't be using, people often say, hey, but it's on the app, the app allows it. And this is where access tagging comes in. We don't want to delete all these things from OSM. We just want to properly record uh, who can use them. And there's a well-established tagging scheme that allows us to do exactly that. There's a wiki page that explains all this in its glorious detail. You can map whether you can access something with a snowmobile during a full moon or something. But uh, the most important bits of access tagging are really the access tag itself in the forms of access equals no, access equals yes, or access equals private. That, that means you need permission from the owner or access permissive. That's uh, it's a private path, but the owner is generally okay. Um, there are a couple more like access equals destination or um, access equals agricultural. But, you know, yes, no, private, these are already a very good set to work with. And then we have the uh, mode of transport specific uh, tags like foot equals yes or no, bicycle equals yes or no, motor vehicle equals yes or no. In this talk, I will be focusing on hiking and cycling access on paths and tracks. Of course, the access tagging is available for a much broader range of things, also for rivers and motorways and things. But you know, paths and tracks are the most uh, the, the most frequent source of complaints. And at first, I want to have a look at how the various websites and applications use these tags if they occur in OpenStreetMap. And just to illustrate the concept, we will walk through the different steps with, at first with a path that has no access tags, just showing you how I intend to look at the different apps or different websites. Now this is the OSM website and you can see there's a path here. It's actually quite near where I live. It doesn't have any access tags. And now um, let me switch to the first routing engine or, or web app. This is Komoot. Komoot is uh, quite popular in Germany. Um, and I've selected hiking here and I can now drop a point and say, okay, you start here, set this as a destination. And you see, okay, it gives me a route over this 
path, which was except, expected because um, paths without access tags are generally treated as accessible for pedestrians. So this is how Komoot does it. Let's look at the next contender. This is All Trails. All Trails is uh, very popular in, in the US. You can see how, how the map differs. Uh, compared to Como, they have these, that's the characteristic for all trails is that they always have these little distance markers along the paths and tracks. Now, let's say draw a route here, from here to here, and you see this also leads me over this track, which again was expected. Next in line is uh, Outdoor Active. Outdoor Active, again, is something that's more popular uh, in Europe. Let me click here as a starting point and here, right, this also works. Leads me over this track, this path ex as expected. And the last in my comparison is Ride with GPS. Uh, this website is mainly aimed at cyclists, uh, but for this comparison I've switched to a pedestrian profile here. And then I can click here and ask it to take me there and yeah it works this was the the dry run and now let's start with some interesting paths or tracks that actually have access tags let's start with a simple path that simply has access equals no and the path I've selected for this is, is really a poster child for the access equals no situation um, it is tagged as um, access forbidden uh, danger of death through uh, breaking parts of of the coast. So <laughs> it's actually really dangerous to uh, to use this. It's uh, near Kiel on on the coast in northern Germany. Right. Let's see what the different routing routing engines do with this. So this is the Komoot version. Um, it's interesting that you can't really see that this is no access. It doesn't actually give you much hints. If you squint very hard, you will see little uh, circular crossed through signs here, here, and here. These symbolize no access, but they're, at least in the web interface, they're really very hard to see. I don't know if this is any better in the app. Um, and to make matters worse, there are actually a couple of recommended uh, places for hiking, you know, like uh, nice views. Here's a waterfall. Uh, here you can see the coast uh, in, in, the, in the sunset and so on. So um, maybe not the best move on the part of Komoot to display these things along a path that, according to OSM, can get you killed if you go there. But yeah, so let's see whether it actually... Um, looks at these tags for routing. I'll put a start marker here and a destination marker here. Right, so it leads me around it. It doesn't doesn't send me through the no access bit. At least that's that's good. Let's see if I can force it. What if I say I want to start somewhere here? No. So this is an indication for the the access equals no bit probably not being in the routing graph at all. This is good, so it has ignored them. But it still shows the track on the map, and it has these things here, which isn't uh, isn't the brightest move. Next, all trails. Um, there is not a really clear indication of no access, but at least the the line gets a smaller smaller dot pattern here, and back here, which is a little bit outside of the actual way that we are looking at, uh, but this bit in OSM has the very same tagging. It's also access equals no. Over here, they've, they've actually put private on the map. This is something that all trails do. Stuff that is uh, access equals private or access equals no, they just put private on the map. It's better than nothing, but it's not really correct in this case because OSM has access equals no and not access equals private. Let's see what happens if I try to route along. Yeah. This goes all the way around. It's not really clear why it doesn't select this shorter bit here, but at least it doesn't let me use the access equals no bit. Now, Outdoor Active has, it shows the access equals no bit, but in a very, very, um, very thin pattern. 
And if I try to route across, it takes me around, this time the proper way for pedestrians and not all the way around like uh, all trails did. So this is good. Let me see if I can force it. Okay, it, it defaults to a, a B line then. Uh, but it doesn't, so apparently the, the path is not in the routing graph. Let's see what Ride with GPS does. I'll put a start marker over here and the destination here. Uh, it takes you all the way around like all trails did. Again, it should really use this bit here, but at least it doesn't use the dangerous path with access equals no. And even if I try to force it, so we see access equals no is um, a relatively, it works well for routing. Um, it doesn't work well for map display. Most of the websites haven't shown this very well. Like over uh, here in, in Ride with GPS, you don't even see that this is not accessible on the map. For the access equals private case, I have selected a track that is between Osnabrück and Bremen in northern Germany. It's an interesting situation. You are allowed to turn off the main road and uh, drive along this track or, or walk along this track for a bit, but then it becomes access equals private, as you can see, uh, or the bit that leads up to this little pond or lake over here. Let's see what the different apps or websites do with this. At first, Komoot, you can see that there's practically no indication of whether this is private access. It's no different from the usual track rendering. However, if you zoom in further, you see this, the little sign that we had before, the little no access sign. So it is there on the map, but it's very, very hard to see. Now let's see if it does the routing thing correctly. Start here and go here. Ah, doesn't send me across this sends me this way. So it does the routing correctly, but the map isn't perfect. Yeah, you can see it knows exactly how far it can go, but doesn't show it on the map. Next, all trails, same situation. Um, as before, the private path is properly marked. In the same font and styling it normally uses for um, for names of paths, just says private in parentheses. Let's try a routing from here to here, and indeed it lets me use the private path if it is much shorter. It doesn't like using the private path; it considers a large detour to avoid the private path. But at some point, it will send you over the private path and a private, private track actually, and not complain. So this is obviously not perfect. Let's see what Outdoor Active do. Same region. You can see that the private part of the track is light gray, like we had in the access equals no case. Let's try and route across. Doesn't do it, goes around. So that's good. Let me try to force it. No, it steadfastly ignores the private path. So that's better, better for the hiker at least. They won't run into trouble with Outdoor Active. Now this is right with GPS. Same area. Uh, very difficult to discern any difference on the map. I know that somewhere around here it should switch, but nah, there's no difference in rendering, rendering between the public and the private bit. Let's see if it lets me use it. Nope, it goes around. So the routing knows that it can't use it, but it's not really shown on the map. And for this particular test, I was also able to get the results of a Garmin routing from a friend who has a Garmin account. So Garmin uh, also have a web-based routing. 
and map display. So you can see that the Garmin uh, routing also takes you around the access equals private bit. And as for the rendering, it is difficult to see, but it does show a little in italics, it does show a little private along the private track here. So um, Garmin also honors the access equals private tag. Let's now look at a more complicated case. This is a nice little walk along the banks of the River Rhine in the very south of Germany. This is in a place called Wühlen and this path is access equals no, um, but foot equals yes. And this should override the access equals no, so it should basically be default no for everything except for pedestrians who are allowed. Let's see how the different engines deal with that. First commode. Um, there's no special indication here that there's anything particular about this path, but for pedestrians I guess that's okay. Let me try a pedestrian routing. Start here, go here. Yeah. It uses the path without complaining, so it has understood the um, foot equals yes, overriding the access equals no. Let's see if it has actually got this right. Let me select cycling. Yeah, it refuses to use the path for cyclists. Well, if you try very hard, it actually does use it for cyclists, so maybe not the best result. It should really refuse doing that altogether. But you have to try very hard because as soon as you give it a chance to avoid anything, it will. Next up, all trails. One thing that you see right away is it has marked a path, a part of the path as private here, which is wrong for two reasons. First of all, um, this is access equals no, not access equals private. And second, for pedestrians, it is allowed. So um, a pedestrian looking at this map would probably be confused uh, here, over here as well. Let's see if it actually gives us a route along this track from here to here. Tries to avoid it at first, but uh, yeah, you can you can make it go here. Let's switch to cycle routing, see if it knows that with a road bike you cannot go there. Yeah, doesn't doesn't let you go there with a bike, which is correct. Even if you try to force it by giving it no other choice, it doesn't let you use that. That's good. Let's see what the folks at Outdoor Active do. So there's no discernible difference on the map for this access equals no foot equals yes path. Put a start point here, end point here, and yes, it uses the path, so it's happy with with foot equals yes overriding access equals no. Let's cross check with cycling. Let's see, well, bike riding is fine. Yeah, doesn't use the route for bikes, so that's good. You can force it apparently. So no, that's not good. It seems to use the access equals no foot equals yes for bikes as well, which is a bit strange because the test that we had with access equals no, uh, our directive actually refused to use that. Last thing in the list, again, right with GPS, uh, with the pedestrian profile at first. Let's see, uh, uses the path. That's good. And let's change this to the cycling profile. Uh, seems okay. Refuses to let you use it with a bike. Oh, that's good. For my last experiment, I have picked a path south of Hamburg on the banks of the River Elbe. 
in a village called Ova, and this has access equals unknown. And the mapper has actually made a note saying, oh, you can theoretically walk here, I'm not sure if this is allowed. So, access equals unknown. Let's see what the different, engine, different engines make of that. This is commode. Start here. Go here. Let's me use it for bicycles. And let's me use it for pedestrians as well. So, commode doesn't care for access equals unknown. Let's see what all trails do. Put a start marker here, end marker here. Yeah, no problem for hiking and no problem for cycling as well. So, all trails doesn't care for access equals unknown either. This is outdoor active. I will put a start marker here and end marker here. This doesn't let me use it for pedestrians. Just to double check. Yeah, this bit is without access restrictions and the bit over here is equal access equals unknown, so it actually doesn't let us use it. Um, let's see if cycling makes a difference. No, not for cycling either. So Autoactive does not like access equals unknown. This is right with GPS. Let's see what they do. Start here. Go here. They don't mind. They are happy. They let us use it for hiking and cyclist. Yeah, it leads me another way around, but this is just the white, the, the, the cost. It doesn't like going along highway equals path, but it lets you use it on the bicycle as well. Right, let's see what OSM routing engines do. Grafhopper and OSRM from here to here. OSRM lets you walk along it. Grafhopper also lets you walk. And for cycling, OSRM lets you cycle. And Grafhopper, yeah, Grafhopper doesn't like the path, but that's your cycle as well. So all OSM routing engines or standard OSM routing engines actually let you use an access equals unknown path. Here's an overview slide that has a table with all the results from my experiments. I did a few more experiments that I haven't let you through step by step in order not to bore you to death. The main result of this is really the, the maps should be better. Uh, I really need the apps and websites to show when something is access equals private, uh, show that clearly so that people don't get the wrong idea when they see, oh, I'm on this path, looks okay. And it would also be nice if uh, apps could really ignore the uh, access equals unknown bits, because if the access isn't known, then maybe I shouldn't leave people there. Now that we've seen how the access tags are actually used, let's look at how many there are in OpenStreetMap. For these statistics, I have looked at the total length of tracks and paths, not the number of ways in OSM. So we get an idea of uh, how, uh, how, how big a percentage of the actual way path network is covered with access tags. As you can see, of uh, 15 million kilometers of track, about 1 million have some form of access tagging and of 3.5 million of kilometers of path, about half a million have. That's a good start, but we could really use some more. Um, among countries that have more than 50,000 kilometers of tracks and paths, the UK has the best ratio, about 30% of uh, tracks and paths actually have some sort of access tag, uh, followed by the Netherlands and Chile. Germany at about 20% and the US and Canada at around 10%. Now, what, would, what do we do if there are no access tags? If I write a routing engine or an app and there's a path with no access information, where can I go to find out whether this is usable or not? The wiki, of course. There's a wiki page that explains all the details. Uh, it has 
uh, an overview, uh, a global set of defaults, and then it has individual defaults recommended for uh, various countries. So you can have an idea of whether something is, if something is uh, highway equals path and has no access tags, can you use this for cycling or not? Um, this wiki page is incomplete. It lacks lots of information for many countries. Uh, often the table doesn't contain anything about tracks. Uh, it's not really very well maintained and I think no one really uses it. So there's some, some work that could be done here. Um, for the UK, if you scroll down to the UK, it actually says the default should be uh, access equals yes or, or uh, cycling and hiking allowed on highway equals path. And I have it on good authority that this is actually not right. And if you have a path in the UK, you should assume it's access equals private if no public right of way is mapped. Now, as you know, in OpenStreetMap, our approach is iterative. You can add something, add whatever you know, and someone else adds more details, and that's how the map grows. But as we have seen, the default access assumption for path, and most often also for track, is that you can go there, you can walk there or cycle there. This means that whenever you add a highway equals track or highway, highway equals path without any access restrictions, say you're just tracing it from aerial imagery in an area you know nothing about, but you can see there's a path and you add that, you will attract people using that path. So I know many mappers who will now say, wait a minute, I've never said that you can walk there, just said there's a path. but with the default assumption of everyone being, well, if there's a path and you can use it, there's a problem. There is a tag I mentioned that earlier, it's called access equals unknown. It's very rarely used and uh, apps don't actually honor that at the moment. And it doesn't come natural to us as mappers because normally if you don't know something, you just don't map it. Like if you map a building and you don't know how high it is, you don't put height equals unknown, you just put no height and then someone else can add that. So maybe we should think about using an explicit access equals unknown so that we don't fall into this trap of, you know, no access is specified, so it must be legal. As if all these issues weren't bad enough, uh, there's more trouble around the corner. For example, here in this military area, there's a couple of tracks that do not have any access restrictions on them. Does that mean I can just use them even though they're in a military area? The same applies, of course, to uh, paths and tracks in uh, state parks, nature reserves and so on. Um, it's often guesswork to find out whether you can use them or not. Wrapping up, I would like to end with a number of recommendations. If you are a mapper, consider using proper access tags wherever you can. Obviously, if something is a private path or track, put access equals private. Otherwise, if you know that it's usable for pedestrians or cyclists, put an explicit uh, foot equals yes or a bicycle equals yes, just to make it clear. So much easier if we know exactly what the case is. If you map from aerial imagery in an area you know nothing about, then consider using access equals unknown. It is not frequently used, but at least it makes it very clear that you have no idea whether you will get shot at by walking there or not. And most importantly, always be aware of your responsibility. If you add a path to the map, you add hikers to reality. Be aware of that and don't just guess something. To the community as a whole, my advice is to improve the documentation of the countrywide or global defaults, have the conversation in the community, okay, people in our country, in our area, what is the default situation, um, make it clear, document it so that people building routing engines and mappers know what exactly is meant by something that does not have an explicit access tag. And my recommendation to the writers of apps or developers of routing engines is, first of all, respect the existing access tags. If something is access equals private, don't send people along. If some, something is foot equals no, 
don't send pedestrians along and so on. Even better, if you can build a, uh, a mode of routing that errs on the side of caution, where you say, okay, if it, if it isn't explicitly tagged for access, then I will not send people there. Or if you don't want to do that, at least um, honor the access equals unknown. Also, put it on the map. If something is access equals private or access equals no, that should be clearly visible on the map, or maybe it shouldn't even be on the map. And publish exactly what tags of OpenStreetMap you use to build your routing graphs so that the OSM community knows what the consequences are, so that when we add something to the map, we know how is this going to look in all trails and how uh, is all trails going to use these tags that I put in to restrict access if necessary. doesn't mean that the community will uh, adopt to whatever the routing engines are doing. It, that would probably be wrong, but at least it can't hurt to know what the effects are. Thank you for listening, and I hope that uh, this talk does its part to reduce the number of problems that are reported with OpenStreetMap. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Frederick, for, for that uh, interesting talk about routing and responsibility. I always say people before data and communities before data, at least I do in my work. So I think it's a really good demonstration of when you're mapping with routing, um, you certainly have demonstrated why it's important in respecting that. So you do have a lot of questions, Frederick. So I, I did ask people to vote those up um, and do take a copy of them because I'm sure that you're going to have to ask some of them later. So the top voted question for you was, um, and this is from OpenStreetMap Belgium, I believe. Um, um, they've had a few apps to improve private rendering. Some of them are OSM and Windy Maps didn't agree. What can we do more about the kind of collisions between all these different apps and the ways that they work? Over to you, Frederick. I think um, you can you can of course always try and talk to them and have more people try and talk to them. But it these these apps and websites will probably listen most to their own customer base or their own target group. Mm -hmm. So uh, if talking to them doesn't work, then maybe uh, we should try talking to their users and basically uh, tell or, or seek a dialogue with like users of Windy Maps so that they uh, go to their map provider and say, hey, you know, your map is low quality because it has recently led me down a path that I wasn't allowed to use. Mm -hmm. um, I would that that's something I would try. Of course, it depends on who the customer base is and and whether that's viable or not. Yeah, thanks for the thanks for that answer, Frederick. So we have another one. Um, this is one of the things where many countries have small local differences. Should we have a machine readable by country rules on how to interpret restrictions? Oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> it's it, it's certainly some something interesting and uh, and yesterday Sarah touched on a very similar thing in her talk about nominatum when she said that uh, by leaving that open we're basically uh, um, letting app developers or, or third parties uh, make their own body of knowledge and rules about uh, country defaults. And then that lives outside of OSM and these people use it to sort of enrich their data, but we don't have that value in OSM, which is something we don't like. So yes, we should definitely work on that. We should definitely uh, discuss what uh, countrywide defaults should be or regional defaults should be and find a way to encode that. I am not sure if the OSM database itself is the right place. I know mm -hmm. that uh, people sometimes do things like tag, for example, uh, with uh, same thing with speed limit defaults. How fast can you go on a motorway in France? Sometimes people tag that on a on the France boundary relation as a kind of countrywide defaults. Interesting concept, but maybe not totally well thought out and this is we have to find a, a good way to do it maybe it needs another place to live this information but we should definitely mm -hmm. connect collect that and store it somewhere and just in terms of if it was to happen would that be within the dwg or would it happen 
somewhere else? Like if people wanted to work on that kind of concept, where would they work with an OpenStreetMap? Certainly not the DWG because the DWG only pops up when there's a conflict and, and this is mm -hmm. not, not, not a big issue at the moment. So I, I would hope that people organize uh, on the mailing list or something and say, okay, uh, let's sort of e either make a tagging proposal and discuss that or say, you know, let's collect ideas on the wiki page or, or something like the usual, uh, the usual things that the community uses to uh, find consensus. All right. So, so everyone's got some homework to do something on the wiki page. Um, that way it's documented and to join the data working group. Um, that was my way to pitch for the data working group. It wasn't very slick, but I tried Frederick. Um, so your talk is focusing on routing, but what about rendering? Even if the main OSM, OSM org style is not clear with red dashes are private, should OSMF org be leading the way? So how should we change? So um, OSMF currently, so the ideal map would have a selector where you can say, I am a cyclist, I am a pedestrian, I am a, a motorist, and it would then show the access accordingly. Currently, uh, OpenStreetMap does show private access um, or access equals no by uh, giving, giving the paths or, or roads either a, a dash pattern or painting them in a very light color. But it cannot differentiate between a situation that I showed in my talk where you have like access equals private, but foot equals yes or something like that. And that would require a, a mechanism on the map where you say, I am a pedestrian. And then it would basically show those paths as normal paths because you can use them. And that would require, uh, we can probably only do that once we have vector tiles on openstreetmap.org because then we can provide a number of different map styles at the same time, which would currently be too taxing for the infrastructure. Now, I know there's a lot of questions here and a lot of comments. I, I should say that I think we, this is our last question um, and I'll have to check with my timing here. But um, do you know what apps will do with uh, bicycle equals dismount? I don't. Um, I know that a couple of bicycle routing engines will uh, consider any anything that has bicycle equals no, uh, mm -hmm. but foot equals yes, as, okay, you can go here if you push your bike. Because in most jurisdictions, someone pushing a bike is legally a pedestrian. So even if it says you cannot cycle here, you will also, you will usually be allowed to push your bike. So many apps do actually by default interpret a combination of bicycle equals no and foot equals yes as bicycle dismount and will actually tell you in the routing description, okay, you have to push your bike here for like 500 meters or something. But I don't have an overview of who exactly does that. Okay, well, there, there's some other homework for somebody else. Um, if you are not watching li this live thing, there's been some interesting chats around taxonomy and other things that we can talk about in terms of routing and privacy. Um, so that's why you need to come to the live event if you can. So I'm gonna ask the last question. I'm just gonna take the liberty on that one. Um, when there is already access, when there are already access restrictions on the gate crossing the path, should the access restriction be added to the highway too? For example, military, which is always it's an example that you brought up earlier. Please go ahead. Yeah, Patrick. it's uh, th th that's a difficult one because we often say in OSM, you know, it's it's like with the is in tag. Should every place that is in Germany be tagged is in Germany? And we say no because that's trivial to find out from the from the boundary. And many people say it is just as trivial to find out that a certain path is inside a, say, uh, a, a military area or a, a nature um, conservancy area or something, and therefore uh, shouldn't be, should by default be uh, not usable. But um, as we don't have hard and fast rules on that, I would always suggest to just duplicate things a little and just put access equals private or something on the path as well. Even if that duplicates information and it's it's not really nice from a data modeling point of view, you would say you'd like to say, okay, this information is in one place and in one place only, but you know, a little redundancy doesn't hurt and even helps us in sort of, you know, if, uh, even helps us um, finding errors. If we say, okay, the, here, there's a gate here, 
that is marked as if everyone can pass, but then behind that there's a street that says it's not available for cyclists or something, then we can say, okay, there's a problem here, maybe someone has to look at that. So um, even if it's not, even if you don't like it, I would suggest just add the information twice, it doesn't hurt. That's right. So, um, so Frederick, thanks so much for answering rapidly all those questions. There's a couple more ha hanging questions, but I know we need to end and I want to give you a closing thought a moment. So for those of you that still have questions for Frederick, do you know that there's an after talk chat space in the platform where you can go and ask Frederick questions and I encourage you to have a chat. And um, Frederick, just one last question for me. How can people, um, how can people learn about the data working group? What, what, how can they get involved? Um, th there's a th there's a page on if if you go to the osmfoundation.org uh, site, there's a, a chapter about the data working group, and that also has a couple of uh, uh, information about um, information for prospective members, like what what do we expect, how much work is it going to be, what I know, what am I going to be doing, and so on. And um, if if you're interested in that kind of work, uh, then the data working group is happy to hear your application. Wonderful. Okay. So thanks again, Frederick. Uh, I don't know if we can hear you clapping. If we were in a room together, we would. And I didn't create any kind of clapping platform near my computer. So with that, I'm going to close this session and just say thanks again for all your comments and for your questions and for Frederick for preparing the talk on uh, having more responsibility in how we do routing and work. So thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.